Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home. I'm Alan Sepinwall, the chief TV critic from Rolling Stone. The SAG After Foundation has a COVID-19 relief fund to support SAG After performers who are in urgent need as this pandemic continues. Since March of 2020, the foundation has given over $6.1 million in aid to 6,500 performers and families facing extreme hardship. If you are a SAG After member and you need help, please ask. And if you're able to support our community in this crucial effort, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. Now, it is my enormous pleasure to introduce Ethan Hawke and Joshua Caleb Johnson from The Good Lord Bird. Guys, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. All right, Ethan, I want to start with the book uh, by James McBride. How did you first come across it and what was your reaction as you read it? Well, obviously, if we made a show out of it, you can probably bet how I felt when I read it. I um, the, the story of how I came across it is a little strange. I, I was actually doing a movie. I was doing Magnificent Seven uh, in Louisiana with Denzel. And the camera operator, operator one day leaned over to me and said, man, you should play John Brown. I'm like, what makes you say that? And he said, I'm just reading the most amazing book, The Good Lord Bird. It's just incredible. And you'd be great in it. And I thought, The Good Lord Bird? What, the, what is that title? I, I, what is that? He said, you know, when you see a bird that's so beautiful, you just say, good Lord. And there was something about his passion for it and the title that just, it, it dug a hole in my head. And so then I ordered the book and I read it. And I just, I had, I've only had this experience a few times in my life where a book just, you just, it becomes better than real life. I loved it so much. Uh, the fact that he could write something so funny and so human and so political and so powerful and do it so easily. It just seemed to just like breathing to him. It just flowed out. And I had that feeling where you just want to give it to everybody you know. And then that slowly turned into desire to actually, you know, make a movie out of it. But did you, as you're reading it, like, or even in the, in the immediate aftermath of reading it, did you think, oh, he's right, I should play John Brown? No, funnily enough, to be honest with you, I had the thought, God, how old does he think I am? I'm too young <laughs> to play this part. What's he, nuts? Um, no, I, <laughs> at first I was like, oh, you know, I'll play Owen or something. I, I, it takes you a while to start realizing, oh, wait, I'm 50 years old. I could play this part. And then... And then I got excited about it. All right, so Joshua, what did you know about John Brown before all of this began? Well, luckily I was lucky enough to have a really good history teacher when it, for my seventh and eighth grade history years. And I learned a lot about John Brown. We actually spent like a whole semester just on him, kind of just keep going back to him like in his, you know, raid on Harper's Ferry and everything like that. And so I had a lot of knowledge on the subject. What was your history teacher's take on Brown? Because the, the miniseries spends a lot of time saying, what, was he a hero? Was he a madman? Was he a fool? Uh, I'm just curious what your, what your teacher thought of him. My teacher, same as me, we thought John Brown was an American hero who deserves his own statue at Harper's Ferry, in, my, in his opinion, in my opinion. Um, so when it came time to actually do the project for, for both of you, what sort of research did you wind up doing? Well, a lot of it we did together. I mean, it's amazing. One of the joys, Joshua, if I can jump in here, one of the joys of getting to be an actor was, I mean, I remember one of the first times you and I were riding our horses together and you start, you know, you, you each pick up on each other's uh, research. You know, we would we were we had this amazing woman who runs the uh, Civil War Museum in Richmond come and speak to all the actors. Uh, she was a valuable resource. Our costume designer, you know, was the the walls were littered with images, and everybody's handing you know different articles they've read. And of course, every when you tell somebody you're working on this, everybody you know is sending you emails about, "Hey, did you know this about John Brown?" It, you become <laughs> exactly, of, yeah. Yeah. Was that your experience, Joshua? Yeah, I had, you know, once I told some people, I had people sending me, you know, articles and books and just telling me random facts about John Brown that I never knew of. And also kind of like the costume thing, 
what helped a lot was our prop guys. Uh, John Burt, he, every single day, you know, I'd ask him various questions because he was very knowledgeable on the subject of John Brown and just everything that had to do with Virginia. And then on top of that, you know, my history teacher. So it was, it was like research for me. Another thing was I read a lot of books, a lot of books. I watched a lot of movies, not even just about like the time period or about John Brown, but I watched a lot of movies where just, you know, the main characters kind of flawlessly fell into their role and, you know, just became the character, not just tried to act like the character. Yeah. It was, it was, I agree with you about John, our prop master. There's something almost magical about when somebody comes to you, Hey, I found a Bible from 1840 from upstate New York. This is exactly the kind of Bible. This is like, this could have been the Bible they carried and you, open it up and you see the pages and the care with which it was printed. And you imagine carrying something that heavy around with you everywhere. Or, you, you know, they, they have all the, you know, they would take us out and teach us how to load those old weapons. You know, I mean, they, there's things there, those flintlock things are tricky to fire. And, um, and just even in those exercises, the whole, your imagination becomes real and you start to get to dive into the world. Yeah. Uh, Joshua, you mentioned before about the wardrobe, and I, I wanted to ask about the dress. Like, how helpful was was the dress in sort of getting into character? Uh, let's start there. I mean, the dress was very helpful getting into character because the dress was new to Onion, and the dress was new to me, and it was like one of those things where it wasn't super hard at the same time for me because I mean, once I just put my mind to where onions mindset is, you know, I'm wearing this dress just to like survive and I'm using it as a tool for survival because I don't know what onions going to do. If he, if he tells John Brown and John Brown finds out that he's actually a boy, he doesn't know what's going to happen. And so, I mean, getting into character, it was actually a really fun experience. Probably one of the funnest I've ever had. And, you know, I wouldn't have, change that experience for anything. We also had a real blessing because, you know, James McBride was a producer and he was around and he was a, you know, a resource for us, not just with his book. The, the book is obviously our talisman. It was our spiritual guide. I mean, that's what we were following, but he'd done years of, you know, he'd, he'd researched a book about Harriet Tubman before he'd researched a book about John Brown. So he was an invaluable resource for us to, constantly be able to text and call and ask questions and make it all come alive. Uh, for, for Ethan, in terms of the costuming of Brown to me is, is interesting, but the facial hair, especially the, the beard and the evolution of the beard over the, over the course of the project, uh, how did you figure out like how long it should be at different phases and how wild it should, it should look? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that was kind of one of the first most people, if they know anything about John Brown, have this picture of him with the big beard in their brain. That's like kind of all people know. There's a couple of famous paintings and there's a uh, <laughs> few famous photographs that all usually involve this kind of Noah-like beard. And I was trying to figure out, well, did he always have that beard? And it was a real insight into the character for me that he didn't start growing a beard until he was wanted for murder, that it was actually a disguise. And once I realized that, it had a motivation. It wasn't a vanity tool. It wasn't something he always did. He was always clean shaven until the fights in bloody Kansas started out and they started having a wanted poster with his drawing on it. So I decided to start the movie, you know, with just a couple of days growth there. I'm in the barber shop. I'm getting a haircut. And then <clears throat> through those gunfights, he just stops growing it. And so each time there's a time passage, I would just, let it grow. And I, I was lucky because we basically shot in sequence. I mean, you know, through each episode, Onion and John Brown are on a journey that goes in time sequential order. And, and we, we shot it that way. So we could, Joshua and I could change as our characters were changing. Jo you exactly. know, Joshua's young enough that you were a different dude by the end of the shoot. Most definitely. I don't know if we, if we like shot out of order. I don't know how that would have worked because I mean, by the end of the project, I grew around probably like four or five inches and then Your also you know changed. I just my voice changed my shoulders got broader I just yeah. you know I started becoming a young man and it was it would have been rough if we had to shoot you know different episodes out of order yeah it's not like you're ever really that convincing as a girl but by the end you are very not convincing as a girl <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
I actually want to talk about that because it's uh, there's times in the miniseries where it feels as if he's actually putting in an effort like, okay, everyone thinks I'm a girl. That's what's helping to keep me alive. I've, I've got to really put into it. And then it feels like there's other times where it's just I'm wearing a dress and people think I'm a girl and that's all the effort I have to put into it. How good of an actor do you think Onion is? I mean, back in that time, all black people looked the same. You know, so if I put on a dress, they're like, oh, it's a, it's a black girl in a dress. It, it didn't look much different than anything else. They didn't really look. But to the white actually, people. Exactly, yeah. exactly to the white people. Yeah, to white people. Yeah. I didn't look different than any other, you know, black person back in that time. And so and you didn't really have to put on an act at all to be like to pretend to be a girl. It was just people that's why I never really think of it as pretending to be a girl. It's just people mistook him as a girl and you didn't say no. And so I mean it was I think Onion is just one of like to go with the flow. I mean, he's very adaptive to his surroundings. So it was it was interesting, you know, a lot of the book really what McBride is doing is, he's, you know, he's talking about the abolitionist movement. So you think it's going to be a story about race. And then all of a sudden, Joshua, you know, Onion gets put in a dress. And now all of a sudden it's about gender. And you realize that he's not really talking about either. He's talking about humanity. He's talking about identity. It's not North. It's not South. It's not free. It's not slave. It's this gray nuanced area. And Joshua was just asked to live in it. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the show draws a tremendous amount of humor from the fact that every black person understands exactly who Joshua is. Oh, immediately, almost immediately. Immediately, every, every yeah. character he comes to. And, and like, the oh, white yeah, people yeah. are just oblivious, you know. It's... Well, there's speaking of oblivion, there's a moment towards the end where Onion says to John, no, I'm, I'm not a girl, I'm, I'm a boy. And John sort of takes it like very matter of factly. As Ethan, as you're sort of going through the course of this, how much like does John really believe in this lie he's created about this kid? Like, does he just always assume that this is a girl despite everyone trying to tell him otherwise? Or at a certain point, is he just playing along because it's better for the story? It's a really good question. And it's one I thought a lot about. And I honestly think he doesn't care. I honestly think he just doesn't care if he's a boy or a girl. I, I, I think he grows to love this person. And I don't know about you, but I've met a handful of real do-gooders in my life, people who are really willing to live outside of the box of society and break society's rules. And to do that, you just have to think radically different. You have a different, this person, John Brown, was a Christian first and foremost, and we are all children of our maker. And that is what he concerned himself with. And I think like a lot of older people that are a little wild, he kind of makes his own narrative. In the way I played it, I know that I mistaken for a girl. I think John Brown starts thinking somewhere along the line that Onion just wants to wear a dress and he's going along with it for Onion's sake because that's what Onion wants. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the way I play the last scene is like, all right, hey, you want to take, take off the dress? It's no problem for me. I knew all the time. I don't know if he did or didn't. He just, he didn't care. He loved the guy, the girl, whatever. He didn't care. He loved, loved this the person. person. Yeah, he loved yeah. this person. And this person had his back over and over again. What does it matter what he wants to wear? It's a, it's a great line. I don't care what you know, any more than what shoes you wear. It doesn't matter to me, whatever you want. Well, th that brings me to something related, which is this matter of whether Brown is crazy, crazy like a fox, both. Like there, there are definitely times where he just seems like this incredibly lucky fool who has stumbled into other things. And then there are times when he seems to very clearly know what he's doing. How much is he playing a role in all of this? And how much has he sort of disappeared into the role he has created for himself? Well, that's another great question. You know, that goes along with the beard. And, you know, back in the day, you know, pirates used to do this. John Brown would put weird things on his body, embers. He wanted to make, they didn't have the internet. There's no news. <laughs> so you wanted people to be scared of you. So when you got in a gunfight, you would act crazy, you know, so that people would be afraid of you. And he tried to create a legend. And it's a little bit like, oh, I don't know whether McMurphy and Cuckoo's Nest is a long line of 
people who are pretending to be crazy because they might be crazy, you know, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, it's a chicken or egg situation. He is a radical thinker. He does not, you can't do what he did and be like an ordinary person. If you read the man's letters from prison, he is definitely sane. These are not chicken scratches of a madman. This is a political activist who, who believes in the unwavering equality of mankind and is on a mission to wake America up. Uh, so that's the real person. James McBride's John Brown is seen through Joshua's eyes. So I think all I am to, to Onion in the beginning is just a crazy old white guy. By somewhere towards the middle of the show, we stop being labels to each other and we get to know one another. And, and I think if, if you watch the show, John Brown gets a little saner, not much saner, but a little saner the more <laughs> Onion gets to know him. Yeah. That makes sense to you, right, Joshua? Yeah, it does. I mean, as you said, it's the story through Onion's eyes, Onion's point of view. So it's not even saying that John Brown was actually a crazy nut. It was just what Onion thought was crazy. And so that's what was portrayed. So it's a very fortunate thing that you were able to shoot this largely in sequence because that's usually not the way it works. And you get to see the relationship build as the same time that your relationship is building. So what was that like for the two of you to work together from this point very early on where you didn't know each other very well to the point at the end where both the characters and you as actors have been close for quite some time? I think it just it just made it look more authentic. I mean, personally, because we had the same relationship as Onion and John Brown actually had. You know, we didn't know each other super well in the beginning. I mean, I knew I knew I liked Ethan. He was an, uh, an amazing guy, amazing actor. But it was, you know, I didn't fully know him yet. And so as we progressed within, you know, filming the episodes and filming the show, I got to know him. He got to know me. Onion got to know John Brown. John Brown got to know Onion. And so it just kind of came together smoothly. I got to know your mom. You got to know my wife. You got to know Maya. You know, we, we got to know it. One of the things that's heartbreaking to me about the pandemic, not for nothing, is that I've missed, Joshua and I have missed something that often happens, which is being together through the release of a show. Um, you, you know, it's, it's funny. Making a movie or, and creating something, it meant a lot to Joshua. It meant a lot to me. We you know, we put our whole egos and our whole selves into this and that's scary. And there's a tension on set every day because we all, we both wanted to do a good job, you, you know? And, and, and there's something so relaxing about doing press together and hanging out in hotel rooms and ordering pizza and, you know, going out afterwards and talking about what the interview was like. I was really looking forward to you and I having that time together, you know, staying out too late at a premiere, whatever it is, you know, we, we've been robbed of that little, layer of getting to know each other in a stress-free way yeah exactly i mean yes i hope then i wish for that but at the same time i mean because of the pandemic it's i feel like it just worked out how it was supposed to work out at the end i, I, I mean feel that way too. These, these interviews are still an amazingly fun time for me you know just being able to talk and sit down with very different people and just talk about the show is still in a way very good for me because you know it, like you said, we put our blood, sweat, and tears into this, you know, months of just being the characters. And I mean, it, it took a lot for me to get out of my character, if I'm being completely honest. It took me like probably a month and a half, two months, even till today, there's still some aspects of my life where, you know, I, I have that little that. accent. <laughs> yeah, you did worry about that. I, I warned you about when, when a character, when you get your, when a character gets its hooks into you hard, it, it's 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 the last part of the journey is letting it go, you know, and it's 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 difficult. Well, I mean, how was that for you, Ethan? This is a not a small performance you're giving here. It's it's big and it's fantastic and it's really intense. Was it easy, like either at the end of the day or at the end of the shoot, to slip out of John Brown and to go back to being Ethan, or was it hard? It was, there was no aspect of this show that was easy. There were, as Joshua said, there were lots of parts of it that are deeply rewarding now. I mean, Joshua and I were able, you're right, Joshua, now that you say that, I was like, we've gotten to do Zoom interviews for the last few months through a major national crisis in a show talking about race in America when it, social justice is dominating the news and, and on people's minds. 
And in studying Henry Shackelford and John Brown and, and the raid on Harper's Ferry, you put the microscope on the DNA of systemic racism, you know? And so that it's been an honor for the two of us. We've met so many amazing journalists that have taught us things and, and, and talking to people and Q and A's and it's been, it's been powerful. Letting go of a character, you know, I really, I really grew to admire the man so much. Um, it, it's, it's rare where you meet somebody that has that level of courage to really put their life on the line for what they believe. As Frederick Douglass says, you know, any of us can die for human equality any day. You know, it's, it's a hard thing to actually do to die for it. You know, Frederick Douglass, I want to live for it. You know, and but John Brown was willing to light himself on fire. And I, I really, I grew to admire him. And it, we had so much fun. You know, be, we had a big group of people, the, the Brown boys. We had different amazing actors coming in every week, David and Orlando Jones and David Morris. It was so exciting, wasn't it? It's, it's hard to come down off the, the rush of, of yeah. that level of creativity. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting story. You don't necessarily see this where you have like these special guest stars and David comes in for an episode or Steve Zahn comes in or David Morse has this great scene early on. Uh, so like you have these great actors and they're only in there for one hour maybe. And then it's the two of you carrying the whole thing throughout. So what was that experience like for both of you to have people come in just for a little bit and then you kind of had to maintain the, the structure and the tone of it? <laughs> It was amazing. I mean, for me, just to have that, you know, those many veteran actors, I should say, and those many creative minds just come in and give their little their little bit of spice into the recipe of the whole show. And for, for me, especially, especially, I should say, I learned so much during the time. Like, you know, I, I, I knew a great deal about acting before I came in. But I mean, being on the show, learning from Ethan, the V, David, you know, Steve, everybody, all the actors was just amazing. I was able to sit down and observe, you know, different pieces of everyone's techniques and how they do things and how, you know, they like to do things. And I was able to add them to my repertoire. And I feel as though it was just, it made me a better act for each and every episode, just to have those people come in to the show. And I, you know, all those people are amazing actors, amazing people, and they just, they brought life into the show, and I couldn't have asked for anybody, you know, better to play the roles as they played. For me, the, the highlight really was Joshua himself. I mean, the, our final scene uh, was actually the last scene we filmed in the, where Onion comes to visit me in a jail cell the night before John Brown gets uh, executed. And, um, that's the only scene we got to play together where he was dressed as a young man. And, and to watch what he had learned, if, when, in my brain, to go from the young actor that I met in the audition room to the actor who walked on stage and we played, you know, that's like an eight page scene or something where we, yeah, talk, like eight about, nine. we, yeah. we talk about faith and we talk about love and death and time. And I mean, you know, it's a real scene and you were, you were a grown actor then, you know, and it, this, this thing, this event had happened to him where, uh, you know, I, I watched somebody grow up and to get to do that last scene with you, Joshua, that one, that one really is, is the one that's burned in my brain. Yeah. I mean, that's what I, that's why I'm so grateful that we were able to, you know, film in kind of a sequential order because, yeah. Everything that happened, I didn't really have to even draw from anything besides raw emotion that was already built up in me because last scene, that's the last time John Brown sing, uh, John Brown sing Onion. I mean, it's not the last time I'm seeing Ethan, but I mean, but just we in, in the project. Yeah, yeah exactly. In that project. And exactly in those characters. And just last time seeing a lot of people. And so, I mean, that scene was that's probably one of my favorite scenes throughout the whole episode. Probably, yeah, that probably is my favorite scene throughout yeah, everything too. we shot. It was hard. It was just to one of those. It hit. Yeah, it was. It hit hard. I mean, it was hard. It was hard to say goodbye. Like, like, okay, yeah, good job. Yeah, and we went back. I went back to my trailer and I took those boots off, and you know, and just thought, oh, I'm never putting these boots back on. I, I it, it was, you know, when you play it apart for six months, it, it's, 
it's an event in my life. It's an event in my family's life. This exactly, this show, you know, and that's that's the funny part. I mean, I think the morning of my last day wearing a dress, mm-hmm. I looked in the mirror. I was like, "This is it. I I really I don't gotta wear this no more." Like <laughs> like a part of me was happy, but then a part of me was like, "Man, like." This, this it kind of became an extension of myself, an extension of me playing Onion. So it was like one of those things where like, yeah, this is almost an empty part of me. But then, I mean, of course, you learn to grow and move on. Ethan, have- you mentioned before re- remembering being in the audition room with Joshua. What do we, each of you remember about, about that audition? <laughs> you go first. There were a few of them. So um, if I have to pinpoint, I mean, I'll talk about the first one. Uh, first one for me was probably the most fun I've ever had in an auditioning room because, I mean, we just had a lot of fun throughout all the auditions, actually. You know, we did a lot, we did cold reads a few times and it was, I learned so much just from the auditioning room, just from being in a room with him and Kim Coleman. And it was, it was just really funny. And I, I had like a genuinely amazing time just auditioning and being able to show my talents in front of him and Kim. One of the things that was, we have this wonderful casting director, Kim Coleman, who's really intelligent woman and was essential. And, you know, this is a huge, I mean, 150 speaking parts or something like that. So we had a huge effort, but we knew we would only go as far as onion. I mean, it's onions movie. He's our quarterback. And um, we had a lot of fun. There are a lot of young people that are wicked talented and crazy talented, but, we had fun together immediately. And Joshua, not only is he talented, but he was listening and he was curious and he was able to adapt and change. And a lot of young people, you know, they, they prepare an audition, they got it down, that's what they can do and they can't hear you. And if they can't hear you in an audition room, the chances are they probably won't hear you on set either. You, you know, it's the same, it's, it's sometimes even more tense. Uh, so I, I kind of knew when you left the room that, that, you know, we were off to the races. We had to, you know, you're a young guy. We had to put you through the ropes, make sure. (laughs) A few times. Yeah. 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 Make sure you didn't just get lucky. Well, Ethan, you were about the same age when you did Explorers as Joshua was doing this. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I got a couple of questions about that, but the first is, do you feel like that makes you more sensitive to the the, the challenges of being an actor that young and having to carry something that big? It, it, I think it made it both harder and easier for Joshua um, because I know a lot about his experience and that might make me be arrogant and think I know his experience, but we're different men it's different time periods. We have different parents. We have different backgrounds, you, you know? So I hate when older people think they know everything that's going through your brain just because they were once your age. Big deal. You don't know me, you know? And, and I, I know how important family is. I know how important balance is. You know, like being a good at the arts is not dissimilar to being good at athletics or something, you know? A lot is that how you're doing up here? You know, the, the results of your behavior show and how you play if you're an athlete or how you act if you're a performer, but it all starts in how you think. And, and so I know that. I know the way people disrespected me as a child actor. So at least I could not do that, you know? But I also know that I don't like it if people tried too hard to be my friend. Like I got a dad, I've got a mom. I've, I don't need, you know, like chill. I wanna be, you know. So I tried to be sensitive to his situation. Uh, in some ways, it might I might have been harder on him than I would have. You know, I, I also know when you faking it, when you're not. And Joshua never fakes it. That's important to me. You know, Joshua shows up on time. That's important to me. You know, Joshua wants to rehearse. That's important to me. We, we were simpatico. I, I never got the feeling like, oh, I don't, you didn't want to rehearse. You wanted to, too. You wanted the scene to be good, too. Yeah, sure. Wait a time. Let's do it. Let's make it better. Yeah. It literally was like hand in hand. I mean, I, I'm I'm really big on rehearsal because I feel like practice makes perfect. And, you know, as many times as you can, you know, go over things, just make sure everything's right on your end. I feel like the whole scene will be, you know, amazing. And Ethan always was really big on rehearsing, you know, just to make sure that we were both in sync and what we wanted to do and what we wanted to portray in that certain scene, which I loved. 
because I mean, not not a lot of people are like keen to wanting to rehearse. Ethan, how did you come up with the voice you used for John and especially for when he would do those, you know, my name is Osawatomi John Brown, the speeches when the guns are about to come out. How long did that take for you to figure out like how deep and gravelly that was going to get? I was really nervous about it. You know, uh, the older I've gotten, you know, the more I realized like, you know this when you meet a person you know, their voice tells you so much about where they're coming from. You can tell immediately if somebody's angry or they're hiding that they're upset. They, they you can tell a lot about their past. And uh, I don't know, McBride had this thing in the book where he said that John Brown sounded like high timber. I thought that's strange, what, a pine tree, like a high pine. And and I went out to New Paul, uh, not New Paltz, um, Lake Placid, where John Brown was, lived and where he was buried. And that's how I started my journey of trying to get to know John Brown. I went out there and I, I looked at the trees. And I was like, well, what do they sound like? And I was like, I just don't. And I kept, I would try speeches and different voices. And, and then I called McBride and I said, I just don't know what a high pine sounds like. And I, I don't, I can't do it. It doesn't sound good out of my body. And I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, I'm so glad you called. I, I really think I miswrote that. I wrote, I like the word, the way the words high pine looks on the page, but I don't think I'd want to listen to a high pine for seven hours. He's like, I think it should be deeper. I think, and I was like, ah. And then we started talking about shouting over cannon fire, shouting over also how old people are usually losing their hearing. So he probably talks too loud anyway. And how Onion probably, he always felt that people, when he was young and I felt the same way, I always felt like older people were shouting at me. Maybe they weren't, but I always felt like they were. <laughs> and, and so I just started riffing off my, the way my grandfather used to talk to me. You know, you're gonna vote for Jesse Jackson. You know, <laughs> I, I, I can't vote, grandpa. You know, uh, you know and, and so um, I just kind of went with it. And the more I did it, the more I thought it, it you know, it's a tone, the, one of the most difficult things Joshua and I had to do in every episode was walk this balancing act between the pain and the horror of what we were actually talking about and the wit and the humor of McBride's writing and where they marry and how we can walk this razor's edge. And so there's something that needed to be bigger than life, I felt, for it to work. And I found this voice and then I, you got to double down on yourself. You know, you just got to go. <laughs> and Joshua, when he was like really in one of those fire and brimstone speeches, what was it like to be like in the scene with him reacting to that? I mean, it wasn't hard to really act even at that point. It was just really reacting to, you know, just the amount of bass and, you know, just the amount of passion coming out of his words. I mean, it's, it's, I saw John Brown in front of me. It wasn't Ethan screaming at the top of his lungs. It was John Brown, you know, saying what it was and where he was from. And it was just this really, it was like a balance of being really funny, but at the same time, very, like very serious. Like I couldn't, I, I would try my best to laugh at times, but there was, I, I never caught myself laughing at Ethan, at Ethan's like uh, speechifying, we should say. It was just like, it was just John Brown to me. That's what Ethan pictured as John Brown. And so that's what I pictured as John Brown. And it just, it just went, went hand in hand with how I was playing Onion. So, I mean, I just think, like Ethan said, we were just very in sync as, you know, an ensemble of actors. And, and I want to ask you also, Ethan talked before about sort of trying to balance these, and you said it too, these very serious subjects with very witty material, you know, out of McBride. Like this is a very emotional project, but it's also a really funny story too. Like, how did you feel about like the idea, oh, we're gonna do a comedy involving slavery and all of these other things. Like, did you either in auditions or reading it or in the process of making it, did you ever find yourself questioning, wait a minute, how is this funny? Or did it always make sense to you? It always made sense to me. I mean, I think that's one of my, you know, jobs as, as an actor, just as a person, you know, one of my callings in life is speaking about things I'm passionate about. And I'm very passionate about, you know, slavery and racism, just the, the mistakes that our country has made in the past. 
And I feel the way James McBride had written the book was exactly how it was supposed to be, you know, brought upon to America and told to America. I mean, because like I've heard Ethan say multiple times, a lot of times I listen more when someone's telling a funny story than when someone's, you know, just screaming and, you know, pounding straight facts at me. And so I think that by having wit and by having, you know, comedy in a lot of ways and kind of lightening the subject, it allows people to not be mad at each other, but it allows people to actually listen and be open to change. And, and finally, for both of you, um, this premiered at a time in, in a year when we've had a lot of racial strife in America, not even necessarily new, but maybe more open than it had been in quite a while. And we've seen that all the way through uh, the terrible things that happened in Washington last week. How do you feel that the meaning of this project, does it change any given the world, the America in which it wound up premiering, or was this sort of always America and therefore this is always the story that you were telling? Well, it's a great question. McBride would say that unfortunately, the topic of race in America has been a vital conversation that needs to be happen every day that America has existed. And strangely for us, Sometimes the climate of the zeitgeist, they don't want to talk about. But the events uh, of the last few years and how this has, I think, made the country ripe to be available for a conversation again. And they're starting to see the value in talking. A lot of times, nobody wants to talk about painful, hurtful things. We want to get along. We want to like each other. Nobody thinks they're a racist, right? Nobody, like... People, everybody thinks they're good, right? The world's bad. I'm just doing, I'm just doing my thing. And I think we were fortunate to fall. Uh, the audience was available for this conversation. And I'm grateful for that. It, I mean, David texted me the other day when this stuff was happening in, 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 in Washington. He just texted, what would Frederick Douglass or John Brown think about that Confederate flag going through our Capitol? You know, what would, what would they think? Would they ever dream that this fight would be going on this long? They shed the blood for us. You know, the blood has been spilled on a biblical level. Gettysburg, I mean, this stuff is terrible. This fight has been exactly. fought, but it hasn't been finished. And I think making art hopefully can be part of the process of healing. Uh, that's my hope. And I completely agree with that. I mean, right now I'm in Mississippi. Uh, filming a show called Woman of the Movement. It's kind of based on the Emmett Till story. Well, it's not kind of, it is based on the Emmett Till story. I'm playing his cousin and, you know, we were going to a rehearsal the other day, me and my mom were driving through and on the countryside, we just saw, you know, a whole bunch of houses just lined with the Confederate flags. And I mean, that just really reminded me why I want to be an actor. One of the reasons I, I love acting is to be able to tell a story and to change people's minds about things and just to change change the topic of America. And I feel like, like Ethan said, racism is never a topic that isn't in the forefront when it comes to America. I mean, since the beginning of America's like, you know, foundation, it's just been one of those things that's always on the table. And, you know, I feel like this show has and has put some fire under this topic, you know, kind of changed a lot of perspectives. And that's, you know, one of my main reasons of that I wanted to be a part of it. And so I think that we have a lot of growing to do as America as a whole still, but I mean, we're getting there step by step. I think that's a good note to end on guys. I could talk about this project forever. It's one of my favorite things I've seen in quite some time. Joshua, Ethan, on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, we want to thank you for joining us and for sharing your experience, process, and craft with your fellow performers. Thank you. Thank you.